Today I'm talking to four of the women behind one of the biggest films of the year, Christopher Nolan's Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer might be essentially about a man, but there are some incredible women behind the scenes. In this episode, I speak to the film's editor, costume designer, head of hair, and head of makeup and prosthetics about their fascinating jobs. Here's a clip from the head of hair, Jamie Lee McIntosh. I don't think I actually realised how many women heads of department there were until we like until after the film, and it was just like, oh wow, that's awesome. I love that. We also, of course, touch on Oppenheimer's female characters in today's Girls on Film. Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy night. I'm going to get that gun of mine, and I'm going to change you from a rooster to a hen with one shot. Some people call me a freak. I hate that word. I don't believe in it. Better yet, I don't believe in labels. You know, I think you're the only girl in the world that can stand on a stage with a spotlight in her eye and still see a diamond inside a man's pocket. Because I'm up at five every morning working my ass off. Does someone want to just tell me to my face, you're never going to give me the scores I deserve? Hello and welcome to Girls on Film. I'm your host, Anna Smith. And today I'm talking to four of the heads of department who helped create Oppenheimer, which was written and directed by Christopher Nolan, and it's available on demand now. The film is based on the 2006 Pulitzer Prize winning book American Prometheus, The Triumph and Tragedy of J. Robert Oppenheimer by Kai Bird and Martin J. Sherwin. It stars Killian Murphy with an all-star supporting cast, including Emily Blunt, Florence Pugh and Robert Downey Jr. As you'll know if you saw it in the cinema, it's the story of J. Robert Oppenheimer following him through the years up to and after his effort to invent the atomic bomb. The film covers a period of 45 years with a stunning attention to detail. I was fascinated to hear from the powerhouse women behind the scenes who made Oppenheimer look as good as it does. In this episode I speak to the editor of Oppenheimer, Jennifer Lame, the head of hair, Jamie Lee McIntosh, head of makeup and prosthetics, Louisa Abel, and the film's costume designer, Ellen Morozhnik. First up, here's editor Jennifer Lame. Jen, welcome to Girls on Film. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, congratulations on your amazing work. Thank you so much. Um, I would love to know, before we get into Oppenheimer, uh, for the listeners as well, a bit more about your background and the, and the work that you do that led you on this path to this film. When I was younger, I loved movies. I devoured them. And then I ended up going to a college in um, the small liberal arts college called Wesleyan in Connecticut. It was a very um, kind of watch movies, write about movies. There was a whole like film club. You got to um, project film. So it was very immersive. It wasn't so much making. But then we did make theses uh, for our senior project, and I made a documentary, and I shot over 40 hours of this um, documentary, and I just became obsessed with cutting it down to 10 minutes. And I skipped spring break. I just locked myself into this room and just became obsessed with editing this documentary. And so by the time I graduated, I was like, okay, editing is something I, I feel like I really enjoy, and I really wanted to work and just get a job. So I moved out to L.A., and I just tried to get any kind of job that I could get using that skill. Um, and I had a lot of weird jobs, not in the film industry necessarily. And then I eventually, after begging and <laughs> waiting a long time, got a, um, my first film job. In New I ended up having to move back to New York. And I got my first film job as an apprentice editor on a Sidney Lumet film before The Devil Knows You're Dead. But it was about five years before I got that opportunity of just doing, I mean, I would do like night logging of videos for reality television. I was editing commercials from stock footage, just a lot of grubby work, but super helpful and informative. And here you are. And here I am. On one yeah. of the biggest films of the year. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what an endeavor this film must have been. Can you talk me through um, kind of the approach to the editing and what, and what you discussed with Chris on this one? I came onto this film, I, I wasn't on the shoot on this film because I was on a previous film. Um, so I came onto the, this film after it wrapped which isn't typical, usually the editor's on during the shoot. I asked a lot of editors advice kind of how to approach that because again, you're starting on day one with an insane amount of footage and it's quite daunting. Uh, and a lot of editors discouraged me heavily, like, oh, don't do that, it's really stressful. Um, and no one really gave me good tips because obviously I was gonna do it. So um, yeah, I, was, I went into it being a bit nervous, but I, I showed up um, um, the week after they wrapped, Chris gave me kind of, you know, here it is, just watch as much as you can. I'm gonna go away for three weeks and um, try to cut stuff together, but I really just want you to watch all the footage. Um, and I think there was that, you know, the fact that he was so kind about, you know, do what you can, 
took this huge pressure off of me and I ended up just watching starting from the beginning of the movie which I never get to do right because movies never shoot in order but I got to start from scene one and go through the whole movie and I was just wowed by everything and it was so fun to watch everything and I ended up just cutting it all as I was watching it because that's kind of how my brain works and I got through the whole film it was a really unique experience and I think it was really great to go through it beginning to end because people always ask me about, you know, the times and the black and white and the color. And I think getting to work it from beginning to end on this particular film was actually super helpful. I think it would have been way more confusing and um, disorienting if I were on set every day, cutting it out of order kind of thing. So it was it actually kind of worked out, even though it's not a typical way to work. And is it a very solitary business? Are you doing much collaborating at the stage of editing or it really is just you in the studio? I mean, those three or four weeks, I can't remember how long it was. It was... Um, me primarily by myself, but then I there's you know and there's a team of people that work with me. My um, additional editor Mike Fay, who kind of ran the cutting room, and when I wasn't around, he he would cut scenes on set if they needed to be cut for Chris. Um, he was there and he was super helpful for me because if I was confused by something, he would explain to me what happened or if there was like a scratch on the film and I couldn't use a certain shot. Like there there was a whole mystery of the shoot that I didn't know about. So um, those guys would help me through it and. Yeah, there's people that I interact with during the day to like go have lunch and talk to people. But yeah, mostly I'm in a room by myself. And what would you say, I mean, this is a very broad question, but um, the primary goals of editing a film like this, I mean, obviously there are aspects of to make the story clear, um, but to keep it to time, to enhance certain aspects of the themes. I mean, is there anything you wanted to pick out from that kind of area? I think editing is so hard to talk about because... Um, it's just one of those things where you just like work the material. And I'm and it's just like I'm in a room with the director for many months. I kind of block out a lot what happens <laughs> because it I think it was like two years ago now. But yeah, it's just this immersive experience of just working the material and just becoming immersed and becoming I become an expert on these characters and these people and become obsessed with them. And it's like my life for I mean, I started this movie in May and I finished it around January of next year. So it's it's like six months of just becoming just obsessed with something. Do you know what I mean? And just working it and screening it and talking about it and dreaming about it and thinking about it. And then it's kind of over. So it's so hard to talk about specifically of what went on in those six months. <laughs> it never felt like work. It always felt like I just wanted everybody to love and enjoy the film as much as I did. And so I love screening it. I love watching it over and over again. Um, we screened it every week for two or three people. And I loved doing that. I love learning new things. I love sitting with someone and noticing when maybe they checked out and how to get them back in. Like, you know, it's just this crazy process that's hard to talk about. But um, for me personally, I, I liken it to like playing an instrument or like practicing the piano. Like, I can't tell you how I got, like, got better I get at the that. piece. It's like this intuitive thing, you know? Uh, yeah, I mean, because obviously I, I edit copy as a journalist. Yeah, so like, okay, great. I, I, I can understand great. that would not be easy to describe. Yes, it is very exactly. instinctive, isn't it? Exactly. Like when all of a sudden you figure out the copy, like if I'm like, how did you figure that out? Like, it's hard to tell me you just that. know when it works. Exactly. You're like, right, I've got but that's, it. That's such <laughs> yeah. a weird answer, yeah. right? So but, I do realize like, <laughs> you a really difficult question. <laughs> no, no, of course, and of course that's what people are going to ask yeah. me, but um, I wish I had a better way of articulating it, you know? Tell me about the female characters, because we're girls on film, and obviously, that you know, there's yes. two incredible actresses who you're editing here. Yeah. Can you talk to me a bit about the thought processes of how you were editing those scenes with them in particular? Kitty and Jean are incredible, incredible, integral parts of this film, and I love their characters so much. Kitty... Uh, every scene she's in, I have her lines embedded in my head. Like every scene I feel like is so impactful that she's in. I love her. She's so funny. She's so loyal. She's kind of mean in this great way in her humor. You know, there's parts of her that are unlikable and that's okay. And I like that. And I like that Emily Blunt really embraced that about Kitty. All of her scenes leading up to that last scene when she kind of has the standoff in room 2022. Can a distinction be made between Soviet communism and communism? Well, in the days when I was a member, I thought they were definitely two things. Mm -hmm. I thought that the Communist Party of the United States was concerned with our domestic problems. I now no longer believe this. I believe the whole thing's linked together and spread all over the world. And I have believed this since I left the party 16 years ago. But 17 years ago. My mistake. But you said... Sorry, 18. 18 years ago. Are you familiar with the fact your husband was making contributions to the Spanish Civil War as late as 1942? I knew that Robert gave money from time to time. Did you know this money was going into Communist Party channels? Don't you mean through? 
Pardon? I think you mean through Communist Party channels, don't Ye you? Yes. Yes? Yes. Yes. Then would it be fair to say that this meant that by 1942 your husband had not stopped having anything to do with the Communist Party? You don't have to answer that yes or no. You can answer that any way you wish. I know that. Thank you. It's your question. It's not properly phrased. Do you understand what I'm getting at? I do. Then why don't you answer it that Because I don't like your phrase. Because that scene in the movie, right, when you read it, and it's a pretty stereotypical scene in the sense of like, okay, it's someone and you don't think they're going to do well, and then they do well, and yeah. it's great. And like, we've kind of all seen that scene yeah. in a movie, right? But I think there's something about Emily's performance throughout the film that leading up to that scene, it makes that scene so much more emotional. And I remember my friend who came to an early screening was like, I kind of knew what that scene was going to be the minute it started, and I could have watched like 45 minutes of it. Like, I could, I just loved it. Because there's something about Kitty and Emily's performance of Kitty where you feel there's so much emotion going on there. Like, you see her hand going in her purse. You know that she wishes she could take a drink. You know that she's nervous, but you know that she's she actually loves Oppenheimer. She's loyal to him. She She's the only one that really stands stands up to him like in that room really hardcore and you you see this culmination of this relationship he's hurt her she's hurt him but like they're there for each other and it takes that scene to this next level or makes it this unique special thing and then yeah Florence Pugh's character Jean I think those two characters together are so integral I think Florence does an incredible incredible job showing who Jean is in a short amount of time, right? Because like there's a whole history there. Yeah. Like in the real life, obviously they I think they were they were engaged a bunch and she right. kept breaking up with him. But obviously, you know, the movie's already three hours long. There's a lot of time to cover. And I feel like, you know, yeah, the movie is about Oppenheimer. But I think um without Kitty and Jean, this movie wouldn't be good. You know, it's like there's such a huge huge part of who he was as a person. And I love how much detail that you, you know about every minute of the performance. You must have seen it so many times. Oh my God, yeah. <laughs> That's brilliant. Um, to, to sum up, um, I wanted to ask you to talk a little bit about women in your field and any encouragement you've got for some of our listeners that might want to get into your area of work. Yeah, of course. I think um, it's been really important to me to make sure to give women an opportunity that are coming up. So I always try to hire women. Um, I feel like in my career, like the first person who got me my apprentice job was a woman, this woman, Jennifer Lilly. Um, and I think in general, you know, just finding women in this industry that you can, you know, ask to be a mentor or um, a mentee. And just also for me as a woman, it was really important to always not be embarrassed to ask stupid questions and be okay asking. I would just constantly ask questions. I like to talk a lot. Although no question is stupid. And right? no question like, is yeah. stupid. And I just feel like um, sometimes women, and I know myself, I, starting out, I could, have been, I could be a little more intimidated by the technical stuff. And I know um, stereotypically men, and you know, men aren't as intimidated by it. And I think um, I would just ask them questions and not be afraid to mess up and um, not apologize. I, I, I found myself in, in early my career saying sorry all the time, and I've tried to stop doing that. And I think <laughs> women struggle with that. And um, and yeah, I think just propping each other up and supporting each other and and being a little bold. And I think that's okay. You've just summed up what we're all about on Girls on Film. And I think that a lot of what you said there just applies to life in general. Exactly. So <laughs> thank yeah. you for that. That's yeah, brilliant. Yeah, totally. <laughs> thank you so much, Em, for joining thank Girls you, on guys. Film. Really nice to meet you. That was the editor of Oppenheimer, Jennifer Lane. My next guest is a legendary costume designer, Ellen Morozhnik. Welcome to Girls on Film. Thank you for having me. A pleasure to be here. Big fans of your work. I mean, Thank Basic you. Instinct, Fatal Attraction, some iconic movies. Before we get into Oppenheimer, I'm sure our listeners would love to know how you started in the industry and were there any women in particular that encouraged you on your journey? Well, I started in the industry by happenstance. And uh, I find sometimes a lot of costume designers like happen uh, come into the industry that way. I started by going to visit my husband on a film and they didn't have a costume designer. And they asked me, I designed ready to wear prior to coming into film. And I always loved film from the time I was little and went to the movies all the time. Anyway, so they didn't have a costume designer and it was a bit of, as many years ago, and it was a bit of a soft porn film, <laughs> truth. And, but it, it would, took place in 1910 or 12, and it was in New Orleans, and it was a house of ill repute that was filled with women <laughs> in any event. Um, I was so happy to design it. I was so happy. I didn't know what I was doing. I jumped in the water, didn't know what the heck I was gonna do, and did it. 
And um, it was the beginning of what we are here talking about today. Um, the women that influenced me later on as I, as I went to the next step were colleagues, but they're what I was introduced. It's a very, very odd and funny story, but there was an actor named Tony Roberts and I happened to meet him. I thought, well, I'm going to go to California and bring my portfolio and, and meet people and I'm gonna become a costume designer now. And I met this fellow, Tony Roberts, who he was in a lot of Woody Allen films. And I said, I really would like to be a costume designer. And um, I said, do you know anybody that I could meet? And he said, you know, where do you live? And I told him I lived in New York. And he said, I do know somebody that I'm going to call for you. I showed him my portfolio. He said, you really are a designer and um, I'll help you any way I can, which was, just a blessing, right? And he introduced me to this wonderful woman named Johnny Johnson. And Johnny was a legendary costume designer at that time. And she um, was, I think, almost, it was like at the time of The Wiz. They were making The Wiz, right? And she said, Ellen, obviously you have some talent, but you have to join the union. You have to do the following things. I'm not a fan, but you have to. And so I would suggest get on it really quickly. And if you get in, which you might not, maybe I'll hire you as a runner, as anything. Well, that was like, God, gold, right? Yeah. And she actually, I would say if I had to pick a woman who influenced my career, it was Johnny Johnson, may she rest in peace. Um, I did get into the union. Um, she was working on The Wiz. She didn't have a place for me, but I started to move on in my at my own speed and learned about designing costumes. And that's a great lesson in life, isn't it? Just asking around and, and networking and just putting yourself out there. And Oppenheimer, what an incredible achievement and what a huge job. Can you talk me through some of the, the major challenges that you faced with this one? There were a lot of challenges, actually, because it was a, it was a huge film. I, I think about it now. I didn't necessarily think that they were challenges at the, at the time, <laughs> I don't think. But I think about it now and they were challenges and there were little, little um, hills that we had to climb. And so... I, I would say the first and foremost challenge was that we didn't have much money. And when you don't have much money and you have a very, very large project, you have to be very, very clever in how you're going to allocate the funds, if you will. Are they, are, are they enough funds to actually service the amount of people? I mean, it's not the creative element at the at the beginning. In that case, it's really the nuts and bolts, the practical side, yeah, and the practical yeah. side, yeah. And so, I had a good, very small support team, and um, we figured that out. And that was a major hurdle to get through. The second hurdle that we faced was at the time we were shoot, we were about to shoot. There were a lot of films that were taking place in the 30s, the 20s, 30s, 40s. Right. So what that means is that when you, when you need to pull a stock of costumes to service all the extras in, in the film, the population, let's call it that, of the film, you don't have much to choose from. And that was a very big problem. How'd you get around that? Well, aside from really reaching out to every costume house across the, the globe, there were small vintage dealers throughout the United States that we were able to contact and, and so on. And we were lucky that a couple of people were going out of business and wanted to get, um, get rid of their stock. But what we did do is we figured out a way with the size of the of the principal cast. We knew that we would we would make so much, 
Okay. And there it was a manufacturer in New York that I had used previously on the Nick uh, Greenfield, and they make they're a great suit maker. And generally speaking, they have a factory in New York and so on. And we had enough time and they had enough vintage fabric to really cut and make, I think it was kind of in the neighborhood of 40 suits and so on. So we, we had a good stock of, of that that was new um, that we could fit quite a number of people with. And then we tried desperately as time went on to keep on filling in and filling in. So that was a challenge. And it's clear you have a commitment, obviously, to period detail, but in, in particular working with Christopher Nolan, does he have any specifics? Well, the, that's the practical part. Yeah, yeah. Those two elements are the practical yeah. part. The third part is the creative part. Yeah. So Chris had a, a, very, a number of different asks and um, his notes. I think that's a better way to put it. His notes were very clear. He was not interested in a stylized film or a precious film. So what that means in a period piece is that the attention to detail, 100%, because he loves the reality of it and the authenticity of it. But he also asked for an original element as well. And that was because he wanted it to be accessible, the whole film, to a modern audience. I thought I was going in to really create a precise period film when I was asked to do the project, but that wasn't really the case. And the difference is, is that when you, when that request comes, what that meant to me was that I had to discern all of the periods involved. Okay. I had, I had to look at the twenties, thirties, forties, and so on. And, and actually deconstruct the periods so that I could find what would equal the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, because there was another element involved, is that knowing how Chris can rip apart a story, take apart a story after it's all done, and recon its vision and fusion, and reconfigure it in the way he wants to tell the story, if it is different than the script, right? Because there was so much, all of the periods needed to flow in a way that would never take you out of the, you would never right. say, right. you would never say, oh, am I in 1942 or am I in 1935? You had to just be able to have this, that fluidity I see. Yep. happen, yep. right? That was the creative challenge, is how to achieve all of these characters moving in any way, shape, or form without knowing what you obviously have the script in front of you, but how are they going to move through the story with an abs with absolute fluidity, with no hiccup whatsoever? Because the intention, of course, is to make a seamless film. One more element, nobody wears hats except Killian Murphy. Mm -hmm. And that's a very big element when you, when that is a huge note, but it's coming from, a, from his mind's eye, right? It's his story. So it took a beat and then you, you had to understand that it was not going to interfere with the storytelling. Other hats would interfere with storytelling. The exception, of course, is Albert Einstein, and that's a story point. But in the general population, uh-uh, it's from his point of view. That's a fascinating detail. Thank mm -hmm. you. And what a hat. And that must have taken hat. some uh, creating. That was, we searched the globe, and um, we went to really fine filmmaker, uh, uh, sorry, hat makers um, in Italy. Didn't work out. London, didn't work out. New York didn't work out, and found market at Baron Hats in Los Angeles, um, of all places, to write it at, at a doorstep, basically, who actually had the most perfect fabric, the perfect color, and he, he hit it out of the ballpark the first time out. 
It's extraordinary. Yeah. Um, before I let you go, I just wanted to ask briefly about the female characters because obviously, I mean, Kitty in particular, really interesting character who, of course, had a wonderful career, but we see her kind of reduced to perhaps a frustrated role of having to support her husband. Um, how did you think about that in terms of her costume and her changes of wardrobe? Kitty was quite interesting because she was ambitious. She was quite, um, she also came from a privileged background. Um, and so there was there was a, a, a connection. Um, you could see a connection immediately. We somewhat emphasized that connection a little bit. Um, and I didn't realize it till after it was, we made the choice of the blues, the blue that she first meets Oppenheimer, uh, the blue dress, and his blue. It was it was a natural choice. It just came, and in showing her privilege in in the choices of of her costumes at the very beginning, in setting her up, was important to see her silhouettes be refined fabrications be refined and so on. But as she deconstructs and as she becomes an unwilling mother and an unwilling partner actually, or can not, you know, her ambition was filtered to him, but she was so distraught and so um, unfulfilled at that time that she turned to alcohol and she kind of became that drunk that was so sad. So what we decided to do in that part, we felt that her costumes would not, they could not look like costumes. So what I mean by that is, you know, we all put things together and so on and so forth. And as designers, we try to tell the story through the clothes and add to uh, add a layer to building a character in that time and place and what we did with her is that at that point in Los Alamos where she hated where she was she hated being a mother she didn't know who she was any longer totally distraught in the fittings what we did is we gathered up clothing put it on the floor and just picked up different pieces. And if it looked, I mean, Emily is magnificent, but if it looked like a costume, we'd take it off. We'd take off a piece, we'd take off a piece. Because a woman like that would just, what is she thinking about clothes? She's not thinking about clothing. She's not doing anything to, she doesn't have to go anywhere, she doesn't have to do anything. And she hardly even wants to get dressed. The approach was a naturalness once again to how she actually comes together in a distraught way in Los Alamos. And gradually she comes back together because she still has invested that ambition in him and pulls herself together in, I would say, somewhat of a simple and conservative way and actually makes a strong statement because of that in the end. That's such a fascinating insight. Thank you so much. You're very it's been welcome. such a pleasure talking to you. Thank pleasure, you for joining pleasure. Girls on Film. Thank My you. My pleasure. That was the costume designer for Oppenheimer, Ellen Morozhnik. Now, of course, another hugely important part of the film is the hair, makeup, and prosthetics. The characters in Oppenheimer have to age convincingly. They also have to look right in IMAX. It's a huge job. The hair and makeup departments are often female-led, but this is actually the first time we've had these departments represented on Girls on Film. So it was a real pleasure to have a chat with the head of hair, Jamie Lee McIntosh, and head of makeup and prosthetics, Louisa Abel. Well, welcome to you both to Girls on Film. Thank you. Thank it's you. lovely to have you with us. I mean, Jamie Lee, uh, you've worked on a few films that we featured, actually. Uh, Bombshell, Captain Marvel. Okay. Um, and Louisa, obviously, you've worked with Christopher Nolan a great deal before. I mean, I suppose the question from a lot of our listeners would be how much your very different departments actually collaborate and work together. Yeah, it was great. We, we, um, we were lucky enough to be able to go in right at the beginning with Chris. And so, yeah, our experience was collaborative right from the beginning. I mean, we share everything. It's it's so important on every film, but on this one specifically, because there were so many different layers to the film for aging. And so 
er everything that we did had to be together. It couldn't be a separate entity. Yeah, to get that balance right with with each aging stage, Louisa wanted to needed to kind of push makeup a little bit more. Maybe I would hold back on graying a touch, or I would push with graying, and Louisa would stay at the same makeup aging. So definitely planning from the beginning and then just keeping in touch with each other the entire shoot to make sure we're on the same page and then i think technically for me it was a lot of hair painting it had to be very linear so everything was orchestrated per decade for each character and then within that you know even without the aging you know we had kitty's breakdown with her alcoholism and mm -hmm. so there were very small nuances throughout every phase of the of all of the actors mm -hmm. so we could keep that linear continuity and then chris could film backwards and forwards the whole way through so what what you see on film you know we were shooting completely out of sequence but uh, you know uh, hopefully that's what we we achieved where we, you got specific continuity throughout the whole film even though we were shooting it out of sequence. I must say that was very impressive because I'm always very alert to continuity with, with hair and with makeup and I didn't spot anything. I mean, this was really amazing. Well done. <laughs> Congratulations. Oh, and I also saw in the DVD extras, um, Emily Rudd saying, you know, how long it was sitting in the chair having all those prosthetics. Can you talk to me more about that process? I mean, yeah. it's, it's really elaborate, isn't it? Well, yeah, I mean, we, we tested everything a lot, you know, because m most people had three up to five stages of aging. And so each character was tested and designed specifically for them. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, certainly with Emily, um, her pieces, we we started off with a lot more pieces on her for the younger phase of her, mm -hmm. of her aging. And then we ended up pulling back a bit because, um, you know, you had to be not distracted when you saw the aging. It had to enhance the story. So all of the choices were so specific for each character. So literally we were changing minuscule details on every piece that we applied to allow it to move within her face and that had, that was the same with every actor it was it was very detailed outside of the aging um are there any specific things that you work with um that are different when you're working with christopher nolan for example um for imax um i mean what kind of specific differences are there yes i mean you can see texture when you see imax i mean you saw the film so it, we really had to be very light-handed with all of the paint and even like the younger phases like Killian. Killian had a lot of work to to make him look like and not that he's a, you know old by any means how he looks but there were specific things like no freckles for Oppenheimer because obviously Oppenheimer didn't have freckles and Killian has this beautiful skin so we had to neutralize a lot of that to get the younger look and then add you know the the flush cheek color plumpers inside his mouth to you know, change the shape of his face for the younger side so there were small detail things like that we laid facial hair on some of the other actors so you know there were details that i think you don't actually see on imax but a lot of that was being orchestrated so it wasn't heavy-handed yeah imax it was a first for me so it was definitely just uh keeping on top of it at all times, whole 360 of the head, making sure that every hair is where it needs to be. And then of course with the painting, making sure that it doesn't look painted, because um, there's a fine line of just going too far with that as well. And, and how big's your team, just for the listeners who aren't really aware of the scale of a project like this in terms of, you know, your department? I mean, how many people are working to create, as you say, this, this incredible 3D? You know, impact that we see in the cinema? Um, I think most of the time it was myself, then I would have my assistant department head and two others, so four, and then of course someone helping to process background and then they would hire depending on how many. So you mean all the, what we would call extras in this country? Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, cause that, that is either way, whether or not you're doing the extras, that's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. What kind of hours were you pulling? It's more set with Chris. Chris is very uh, on time every yeah. day so but as far as film industry goes yeah we, yeah yeah, yeah <laughs> it's we not nine to five off, you know getting everyone ready and then clean up so it's so yeah you like the last people to leave in a, in a way well some of the last Sometimes, yeah yeah and in terms of because obviously we're looking on screen and we're seeing it, it's quite a male-dominated film but i'm getting the sense i mean we're supposed to see wonderful women like you 
behind the scenes. Um, it's, what's the sort of gender balance like behind the scenes in terms of the heads of the department and everyone else? Yeah. I don't think I actually realised how many women heads yeah. of department there were until we yeah. just, like until after yeah. the film, and it was yeah. just like, oh wow, that's awesome. I love that. There is a balance. I mean, I mean, obviously the film is called Oppenheimer, so it's Oppenheimer's story. But actually, you know, you've got two really strong female characters in this that are crucial to the story. And both um, Florence and Emily, I, I thought, brought a very strong female balance to the film, even though it's an Oppenheimer story, you know. Tell me about working with, with um, let's start with Florence, because, I mean, we love her, obviously, she's an incredible actress. And how is she, how is she to work with? Um, I adore her. I love her. This is my second time working with her, and she's she's fun like and she's professional and she just brings it every day um so yeah she's a joy to work with and i'm the same i mean but every actor that came on the project were incredible i mean they came prepared they knew exactly what why they were there it was a, it was a joy to work with all of them it really was and and it's hard to do the longevity of what they had to do with, with having long makeups and the hair chair and everything, haircuts. They and they were amazing. Yeah. And what kind of collaboration do you have and conversations do you have with the actors in terms of like a hairline decision or anything like that or anything specific to do with makeup? Well with Chris's films he um we go to the first fitting that they ever have. So it's a completely collaborative thing where it's, you know, director, actor, the costume designer, props, us and there is an initial conversation that is guided by Chris. Mm -hmm. So he'll have had meetings with the actors. So mm -hmm. they come with their ideas, but it, it's definitely with Chris involved. And it's designed to help them you know, perform in the film and then tell the story. I think, as Deweysa was saying, it's incredibly helpful to have Chris in the room to to kind of guide those conversations with everybody um, and then sometimes you get wonderful little surprises once you've actually started camera testing like with um, Robert Downey Jr for instance we were just testing just slicking his own hair back to see what we could get away with and see and if it would, was going to work and then Robert kind of going we need to shave my hairline we need to change my hair and Chris and I are going, this is amazing. We love this idea. <laughs> we were hoping that would happen. Um, so sometimes it doesn't all get worked out in that very first meeting, but uh, it, it definitely gets there. And then there are, there are those moments. I remember when we were doing the oldest look with Emily for Kitty, and I would like prep her hair. She would go into makeup get all that incredible makeup put on, she'd come back to me, I would style, and then I'd do a final coloured hairspray finish mm -hmm. to like darken and kind of mat her hair down. And she would just, once I'd finish, she'd just look and she'd go, there she is. It was just <laughs> that finishing touch to be like, there she is. There she is yeah. yeah, and it's yeah. a nice feeling to hear your cast member say that, you know, that's okay, she's ready to go. When you sit down and watch the film, is there like a cast and crew screening, talk, talk me through it, and, and are you looking at your work or are you able to enjoy and relax and watch the film? I think when you always, when you first watch the film, you are looking for technical things that you want to make sure everything's right, even though you've seen dailies, yeah. to actually see Chris's vision, because that's what we're really doing, you know, facilitating that. It, it was pretty amazing to see it, you know. Yeah. And happy it came out the way it did. Yeah, yeah I think because you put all that planning in the beginning to hope that all those agings and everything's going to hit the mark where it needs to and that that story for us is going to be told how it needs to be told. And as Louisa said, you see bits and pieces as you're going, but then you watch it and you get to the end and you're like, it worked. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> relief must be one of the big yeah, <laughs> yeah. things yeah yeah and obviously you, you mentioned Robert Dungeon and he's in a lot of black and white scenes I mean does that present any kind of different challenges for, for either of your departments for me with because I was bleaching the top of his hair and regrowth comes through very quickly and the contrast of the white and the very dark regrowth so just having to you know it would be like a millimeter and I'd be like oh well, we need to do something about this. <laughs> um, so just really staying on top of that. And I, when you see that in colour, it's not as great of a difference. So I think for me with 
him and spe- like specifically that was something I needed to stay on top of because we were when he was a bit younger I was doing a darker gray and then when he is we see him in his later scenes it's more of a white kind of slick back so there's no room to a bit of hide yeah. <laughs> at all with the IMAX, the close-ups, the, the black and white. That's so, a good way yeah. of putting it, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> Everyone can see everything, mm-hmm. every single detail. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and for our side it definitely, and the makeup side it, and prosthetics, it definitely changes. So one of the first things I always do when we start a film, on every film, is change the lighting within the trailers. So we oh. can do tungsten and daylight. And then obviously we... Poito was very collaborative with us, so it's ask, yeah, yeah, so yeah. to ask him, you know, what kind of lighting we were doing in different scenes, and then obviously with the black and white, it definitely the highlight and and shadows change dramatically in the black and white. So when we tested, we were aware of what the parameters were, so we did change the makeup so that we could use in the black and white use that and actually make a lot of the paint work even finer for the black and white because we we were getting enhancement just from the lighting. All of it was very fine-handed because, you know, it's in the close-ups, it's so ginormous. You know, you've, you've got to be really cautious of not having too much texture, you know, even in the paint. Interesting. I'd love to know how you both got into this, if you've got time to get into that, um, just because I know a lot of our listeners would love to do what you do, a lot of people who are studying film. Um, Louisa, let's start with you. Yeah, well, I, I trained at a, a makeup school and then I ended up doing sort of like traineeship with, within the film industry. And I also d- actually worked in London. I worked at the ENO and I did uh, theatre initially. So I started doing that just to find my feet really and then carried on doing films. Yeah. And yourself? Um, out of high school I did hairdressing. It just wasn't enough. I couldn't walk into the same place every day and do the same thing. Um, and then I watched a behind the scenes film called Full Tilt Boogie, which is behind the scenes of From Dust Till Dawn. And I was like, that looks like so much fun being on set. Um, and in New Zealand, I figured out that I needed to do both makeup and hair. So I went to makeup school and then, yeah, and then I moved to the States and I needed to choose one or the other. So I went back to my, I shouldn't say roots because that's like a pun. But <laughs> yeah. That's a great pun. We love a good pun. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, went back to here. And if you're starting in the film industry, keep going. You can do it. It's all good. Very good advice. Yes, Thank work you. Hard. You'll be fine. I've certainly <laughs> loved hearing more about what you do. Thank you so much for joining Girls on Film. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. That was Head of Hair, Jamie Lee McIntosh, and the Head of Makeup and Prosthetics, Louisa Abel. You're listening to Girls on Film. I'm Anna Smith, and I was joined by Jennifer Lame, Jamie Lee McIntosh, Louisa Abel, and Ellen Moroshnik to talk about Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer is available to watch on demand now. Girls on Film is an HLA production brought to you by executive producer Hedda Archbold, producers Lydia Scott and Charlotte Matheson, and audio editor Jack Howard, with many thanks to our partners for this episode, Universal Pictures. Thanks for listening to Girls on Film. We'll be back very soon. I know that. Thank you.